Uh, actually, I'm uh, filling in for Joe Clark, uh, who, who uh, some of you will know, was here last year. And uh, not really, but I, I have been trying to get in touch with Joe for a number of months just to clear up a little uh, misunderstanding between us that uh, I feel a little bit of guilt and confession is good for the soul. Uh, this misunderstanding between Joe and I uh, actually goes back a number of years and believe it or not uh, involved an incident uh, involving a dog. Uh, I uh, ran against Joe in the yellowhead riding in uh, Alberta in the 1988 federal election and uh, I was doing some door knocking which of course is the way we uh, often campaign and it was late at night it was in an oil field service town called Swan uh, Hills and uh, we should have stopped, but it was getting dark, and I thought I'd do one more house, so I rushed up the steps of this uh, house to greet a voter, and just as I did that, his puppy went across the step, and I, I stepped on its uh, foot. And it started to howl like a stuck pig. You could see doors opening down the block, people sticking their heads out to see what was wrong. The, the owner of the dog grabbed the puppy and ran inside the house to be replaced by his bewildered wife who came out to see what the problem was. Now, now here's the challenge for a politician and a door knocker. What do you do to recover in a situation like that where you've just crippled a voter's puppy uh, and in a town where, where dogs are more highly regarded than the political people? Uh, so there was really only one thing that I could say. I said, good evening, I'm running for parliament, and my name is Joe Clark. <laughs> uh, misunderstanding. But speaking of misunderstandings, uh, this has become a real problem in Canada's relationships, as you know, with the United States. These days, the Americans just don't understand us, and we're at odds over everything from the war on terror to Iraq to softwood lumber to BSE, and now over this missile defense business. Uh, so Martin, uh, that's our Martin, not the other Martin, uh, has suggested that all of us speakers who will be addressing American audiences over the next year should develop some guidelines for Americans on understanding and communicating with Canadians and that we should include these guidelines in our addresses. So I have some guidelines here on explaining the beaver to the ego, which I actually intend to share at Harvard later this month. Uh, I'm delivering the Mackenzie King lecture on the role of seances and maternal fixations in governmental decision making. <laughs> uh, but I would like to give you a little preview of my guidelines, just, just to make sure that I'm on the right track before I expose these to the public. Now, my first guideline for explaining the beaver to the eagle is based on extensive research conducted when I was in the management consulting business before I got in the political business. I, I actually did this. I called up 20 people, all of them Canadians, from a client list and asked them a simple question, just four words. How are you today? And the most frequent answer I received, and you've probably guessed it, was not too bad, which tells us several things about the Canadian psyche and how we communicate. The first is that we Canadians use negatives to convey positive feelings and aspirations. These people who said they were feeling not too bad were actually feeling pretty good, but they expressed that sentiment by using a double negative, not bad. And there are, of course, many examples of this. The other day, I turned my car over to a valet service at the hotel. When I picked it up later, I said to the valet, thank you, to which he replied, no problem. <laughs> now, I hadn't actually anticipated that there would be a problem. <laughs> but of course, what he actually meant was, you're welcome, fine, it's OK. All positive expression, all positive sentiments, but expressed with a double negative. I have here an article from the November 18th Globe and Mail uh, extolling the virtues of civic planning, a positive thing. But the headline reads, the foresight of not doing the wrong thing. <laughs> the foresight of not doing the wrong thing. Uh, 
you know, he's saying it's a good idea to do the right thing, but it's expressed negatively. Uh, I also have a lovely editorial here from Paul Wells from the January 17th edition of Maclean's commending Bono for his crusade on behalf of heavily indebted poor countries. Paul gives Bono's efforts a ringing endorsation expressed the Canadian way. He concludes by saying you can't change the world with a song, uh, but that doesn't mean it hurts to try. <laughs> Even our original Canadian Constitution, the BNA Act of 1867, uses negative terms to express our positive aspirations for nationhood. The first substantive section of our Constitution is labeled Union, proclaiming the positive desire of our original colonies to unite. But this is immediately followed by the declaration in clauses 5 and 6 that Canada shall be divided. In particular, the United Province of Canada shall be severed and divided into two separate provinces, Ontario and Quebec. Here we have the essence and genius of Canadianism, unity through division. <laughs> Deliberately dividing ourselves so as to make unity a priority concern and preoccupation. Unity through division, asserting the positive power of negative thinking, it's the Canadian way. Now, I give you these illustrations because they help in our Canada-U.S. relations. Uh, we uh, use negative terms to express positive feelings, and we simply need to explain this better to the Americans. When our former prime minister and those around him refer to Americans as morons, bastards, and idiots, <laughs> you know, and I know, we, we all know these words are not intended as insults. <laughs> but of course not. Th these are terms of endearment. Uh, th these are exactly the same words that Jean Chrétien uses all the time to express his affection for Paul Martin and the new <laughs> government. But we have to explain this to the Americans or they might just misunderstand. Now, I said a few minutes ago that the most frequent response to the question, how are you today, was not too bad. And the presence of that little modifier, too, uh, tells us something else very important about the Canadian psyche. We Canadians, as Pierre Trudeau once said, are extreme moderates. Why did the Canadian cross the road to get to the middle? Football, soccer, basketball games are divided. How are they divided? Into two parts, the first and the second halves. But our national game, hockey, you remember hockey? How is it divided up into three periods? Why? So that there would be a middle. We Canadians prefer the center. We're scared of falling off the edges. That's why people live in Winnipeg. This also means that we Canadians hate being confronted with stark choices. Here's A and here's B, and now choose one or the other. We hate that situation because there's no middle. And if we're forced into those stark choice situations, we're quite likely to invent a middle by saying, why can't we do both? <laughs> the technical meaning, and this has been lost in a lot of the media coverage, the technical meaning of the verb to dither is to run freely to and fro among the options rather than settling on any one of them. Dithering is a positive Canadian virtue, an expression of extreme moderation. We prefer the muddle of the middle to the clarity of choice. Or in the words of that great American philosopher y Yogi Berra, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. That, that's, that's us. <laughs> <laughs>